So thank you. So I'm David Lubar, chair of the GMC, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our February meeting, which is also our annual meeting. So like all annual meetings, we need to set aside just a couple minutes for uh, a number of kind of pro forma business matters. So um, if you'll indulge me, let me begin with that, and then I'll give a broader welcoming. So um, all of you received a copy of the minutes of the 2019 annual meeting. And do I have a motion to dispense with reading of the minutes? <laughs> all right, I knew that would happen. All right, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor of accepting the minutes? Thank you, that passes. So next is, I'm happy to report that the GMC had a balanced P&L in 2019. So revenues equaled expenses. There was an audit conducted by Riley, Penner, and Benton. That's been completed. The audit uh, has been approved by the board of the GMC. And the 2020 budget has also been approved by the board of the GMC. And dues notices for 2020 have been sent out. So in order to help ensure a balanced budget for 2020, uh, the GMC would appreciate um, responding to your dues notice and uh, prompt payment. Thank you very much. The 2019 annual report will be mailed out shortly. It's a chance for everyone to update themselves on the various initiatives of the GMC. This year it features those who are involved in the initiatives, their uh, interviews, and so uh, you'll be able to kind of see what the activities and the status of the programs are. So you can expect that sometime in the coming week. Then up here you see the slate of uh, directors for the term ending 2021, 22, and 23. The directors for 2023 need to be reelected. Their names are listed there, beginning with Dan Bader down to John Schlifsky. So is there a motion to accept that slate of directors? Second? All right, all in favor? All right, thank you. And that concludes our business. So now we can move on to uh, programming. And so I'd like to, uh, to welcome all of our guests here today. We are expecting Mayor Barrett. He gave his state of the city address this morning. Uh, I'd also like to welcome the Board of Directors of Milwaukee Women, Inc. They will be uh, giving us an, an update. And I'd like to welcome new GMC member, Susan Leverin, who is President and CEO of Von Briesen and Roper. So Susan, do I see you here? Oh, right there, yeah. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Lindsay Hammer. She's chair of Milwaukee Women, Inc. and Gina Peter, GMC member and executive VP of Wells Fargo to present the seventh annual Mary Ellen Stanek Awards for Diversity in Corporate Governance. Lindsay, Gina. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Lindsay Hammer, and again, uh, Milwaukee Women, Inc. is thrilled to be here with the GMC and partner with the GMC on the Mary Ellen Stanek Award. And not that um, anybody needs to be reminded of what the Mary Ellen Stanek Award is, but 
I'm going to take a couple seconds to remind you anyway. Um, it was established in 2013, obviously to um, initially honor Mary Allen. Um, it's given to an individual or an entity demonstrating a commitment to promoting diversity, um, to diversity in the corporate structure and, and, and specifically in governance as well, um, which results in, you know, results in increased gender diversity um, uh, within leadership and, and um, supports, you know, that broader uh, governance and uh, corporate board diversity in the Milwaukee region. And so we are proud, um, Gina and I are here today, are proud to acknowledge um, two award winners this year, um, both a corporate and an individual award. So I'm gonna do the corporate award and then Gina's gonna help with the individual award. Um, I am uh, very pleased to recognize WEC Energy Group um, as our corporate awardee this year of the Mary Allen Stanek Award. Um, WEC is the 11th largest publicly traded utility in the United States, and, and they are being recognized for their commitment to taking a proactive approach and really being a leader in um, diversity, and not only in Milwaukee, but um, you know na nationwide as it relates to their diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, they have been, WEC has been recognized by Forbes as one of America's best employers for diversity. Congratulations for that. Um, WEC's uh, commitment to diversity and inclusion is more than just policies and procedures. It's a core strategic competency, um, an integral part of the company's structure and culture. They are committed to maximizing both individual contributions and organizational effectiveness through um, the diversity of their workforce. Initiatives include um, things like executive and informal mentoring programs, um, including training, such as training uh, leaders on unconscious, unconscious bias and building inclusive teams. Um, WEC Energy Group has had and, and I know some of us follow these numbers. I'm an accountant, so I love these numbers. I apologize, but WEC Energy Group has had three or more women directors on its board since 2012. That's incredible. That's great. Currently, their board has four women on the board and also has three directors um, that are people of color. So congratulations um, to WEC Energy. Let me make one more comment, um, Peggy, and then I will um, congratulate you. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we, we were, were we gonna, we aren't gonna, we are gonna hand it, see? <laughs> Heather's keeping me honest over here. Um, women fill 27% of all management positions at WEC as of um, June 30th, 2019 uh, Milwaukee Women Inc. report, and 59% of the workforce in 2018 was diverse. 26% um, females, 26% minority for a total of 59%. So again, um, an incredible commitment to building, um, you know, a very strong, um, culture around their diversity commitment, and it certainly shows in the numbers. So congratulations to WEC. Um, and, and Peggy, Kelsey is here to accept the award. And I think we'll have a photo opportunity later, but great. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> really appreciate it. Okay, Jim. Thanks. That was great. Congratulations. And thanks to WEC for all that you do in the community. It's great. Um, as last year's recipient of this award individually, I'm really excited to uh, be able to present the award to this year's individual recipient. And in a room full of Milwaukee's top executives and leaders, it is unlikely that anyone is not familiar with our awardee, Linda Gorenslevy. As a partner with real estate development from General Capital, Linda was instrumental in the bold decision to invest in the Century City Project in Milwaukee's Central City. Linda was also managing director at Stark Investment and spent 10 years at Northwestern Mutual, concluding her time there as associate director of investments. In the coming weeks, Linda will be inducted into the Milwaukee Business Journal's 40 Under 40 Hall of Fame. 
In her interview for that publication, Linda shares that she was the first senior executive to have a flexible work option and the first remote user of email at Northwestern Mutual. <laughs> Linda pioneered these policies to accommodate maternity leave and changed opportunities for scores of women who would follow her. For years, Linda has broken down barriers to achieve new orders of excellence and leadership. She's a CPA, she's a CFA, she was valedictorian at UW-Madison, where she earned, earned a BBA, and co-valedictorian at Kellogg at Northwestern, where she earned her MBA. Linda has served as co-chair of MKE United, a board member of Exonia Bank and the Medical College of Wisconsin, among many other roles. She's also received the Sacagawea Award from P Professional Dimensions and the Tempo Mentor Award from Tempo in recognition of her extraordinary contributions to advancing equity and leadership for professional women. Beyond her professional accomplishments and history of firsts, Linda's legacy will define the countless mentees whose lives she encouraged through her personal connection and willingness to give of herself so freely. To quote her nominators, if it weren't for women like Linda, we would be living in a very different world today. We couldn't agree more and are honored to present Linda with the 2020 Mary Ellen Stanek Award for Diversity and Corporate Governance. Please join me in congratulating Linda on this important occasion. I'm honored to receive any award that's named after Mary Ellen Stanek. <laughs> we study correlation, and I don't think it's a coincidence that Baird has been honored as one of Fortune's 100 best companies to work for for 16 consecutive years, just a short time after Mary Ellen joined Baird. This award is particularly meaningful as I've spent my career in a profession where there not have been very many female role models and Mary Ellen is a standout. When I started in the private placement investment group at Northwestern Mutual after graduate school, I was excited to receive my first invitation to a corporate finance outing, which read, lunch will begin in the men's locker room. Fast forward and times have changed and will continue to do so out of necessity, not just because diversity and inclusion is in vogue. We should lean out not necessarily in. Equitable leadership demands that we value our differences and we must do so for the next generation. I thank you for this tribute, but most importantly, I thank Mary Ellen Stanek for forging a path and for being a role model for men and women in our community and beyond. If you're a man, you get to come up this side of the podium, by the way. <laughs> no, Peggy, on behalf of WEC Energy and Linda, congratulations on this recognition. Thank you for your leadership. I think we've all seen uh, major strides made by the business community in the last decade. But for all of you who saw the Oscars last night, I thought it was truly amazing all the references to mom and women that were made and you know maybe it's Hollywood that's leading the way in our country in terms of diversity. But we're making good progress here, so thank you very much. I'd like to now uh, invite Mayor Barrett to come up to talk about the 2020 census and its importance to our community. Thank you, David, and I won't spend a lot of time. First of all, congratulations, ladies. Um, very, very impressive. I'll say this about Linda. On the, on, at first blush, it's really impressive that she was valedictorian of the business school class, and then she dropped all the way down to co-valedictorian. Um, but let's face it, none of you were in class with her, and I'm not sure she would have pulled that off with the brains in this room. Um, just to stroke all of you who are here, but very, very impressive. Um, so just a little religious, um, Religious reminder, 
Why were Joseph and Mary in that manger? The census. It came from Nazareth. Augustus Caesar ordered everyone to return to their home. Joseph was from the house of David. And so it was important for them to return to Bethlehem. So I start that out because it's census time. And you fast forward from the time of Jesus to the founders of our Constitution. And right in our Constitution is a provision that orders the census to take place every 10 years. So on the one hand, it's no big deal other than the birth of Christ and other than the founding of our country. Um, so it is a big deal. It's a big deal to do it. And I'm very proud that in 2010, Wisconsin had the highest return of census forms. Um, but I'm here today very simply to remind us all to get involved in this. This is a community project where nobody, no matter what your politics, um, should have any objection to this. This is just about counting ourselves. And it's important that we do everything that we can. And so we have at the city, and Sharon Robinson, who is here, um, has done a great job leading our effort. Where's Sharon so I can recognize her? She's the one that, Sharon personally goes around for four months counting people. Um, no, Sharon is the one who works with community groups and, and brings people together. And Melissa Baxter um, is someone who is representing the GMC, but with Sharon and Matt Dannenberg as our co-chairs, we feel like we're in good hands. But I'm here just with a public relations reminder. Um, whatever organizations you're involved in, in the next few weeks, people will be getting their census forms. Um, and it's important that everyone be counted. It's important that everyone in Milwaukee be counted because not only are, are the federal allocation of, of congressional seats um, determined by this, but obviously probably more relevant, the, federal, the distribution of federal funds, because we know that there's gonna be, the failure to count people basically comes out to about $1,600 a person. So, so again, I, just, I wanted to be here tonight very, very briefly to say, please, please, please um, stay engaged with this, be engaged with this, uh, and do what you can to make sure that we come back again, number one, as the, the community and the state that does the best job in the country. That's it, thank you very, very much. Okay, Mayor, thank you very much for the update and sharing the importance of the impact of the census on our community. I'd like to now introduce our ne next guest speakers, Austin Ramirez and Jilly Gok Gokogandi. Did I get that right? All right. To share an update on Global Shapers. Born out of the World Economic Forum, the Global Shapers community is a network of inspiring young people working together to address local, regional, and global challenges. With more than 7,000 members worldwide, the Global Shapers community spans 369 city-based hubs in 171 countries. So it's truly a worldwide effort. Please welcome Jilly and Austin. Thanks, David. Uh, before I talk about Global Shapers, I've just got to say, Linda, you're one of my role models, so congratulations and thank you for all you do in Milwaukee. Um, okay, uh, I'm really just here to announce or introduce Jilly, but uh, a quick bit of context. We've got a lot of really fantastic uh, young leadership organizations in Milwaukee. The Global Shapers are a bit different. This is a, kind of the all-star group of leaders in this city. It is intentionally small. There's only about 20 people in the group. Um, and it's cultivated be, to be people that are only under 30, that are diverse, and that are really making an impact today uh, in our community. And, and the power of this group is both in connecting uh, impactful leaders in Milwaukee to each other, but even more so connecting them to over 450 hubs in cities all across the world through the World Economic Forum uh, to like-minded leaders that are uh, engaged not only in making their cities a better place, but in making this world a better place. And Milwaukee was lucky enough after several years of trying uh, to get selected to host what's called Shape North America, uh, and which is literally the Davos for young people, uh, at least of North America. We're gonna have over 250 young leaders from across the Americas here in Milwaukee uh, in late July this summer after the DNC um, to share ideas and, and, and build relationships and magnify the efforts that they're all individually making in their own cities. Um, so we've got an incredible 
group of global shapers here in Milwaukee, but there are only about 20 of them. Uh, they are all under 30, and they're going to need some help to pull off this event. So uh, with that, I'll introduce Julie to come up and, and tell you a bit more. Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Gokul Gandhi. I have the pleasure of serving as the curator or the president of our group this year. And um, I just want to thank Austin. Austin is uh, the founding curator of our group, and um, he's just been really instrumental in making sure that this hub is functioning and a big part of why we got the hub. So I have a couple slides that I've prepared, but before I do that, we do have some Global Shapers, the planning committee of this conference in the room. So if you guys could just stand up and if we could give them a round of applause. They've been doing a lot of hard work and heavy lifting. So. Yeah. Awesome. And they'll be, um, they'll be there to talk to you about this conference after we chat about it. So um, the Global Shapers um, was founded. Oh, I have the clicker. That would, that would make sense. Um, so the, the Global Shapers was actually founded um, after the Arab Spring. The chairman of the World Economic Forum um, was surprised that there was such an uprising of youth and um, missed the mark on understanding what youth needed around the world. And so this initiative was really born out of that and understanding that youth unemployment is at an all-time high around the world, and that we really need to do something to address that as youth are going to be the ones leading the way for our future. So um, as we mentioned, we have hubs all around the world and about 7,000 shapers who are doing heavy lifting um, in their local hubs. So these regional conferences, like Austin said, are very similar to mini Davos. So we have about seven regional events that occur worldwide, and shapers from those regions are invited to go to their regional conferences, but are also invited to come to other regions to learn about the issues and the struggles and the opportunities and challenges that we face in our hub. So it started out um, pretty small, as you can see here. It started out in, in Detroit, Michigan, when they were piloting this program with about 70 shapers, and um, has gone back and forth between a North American um, region, so Canada, and recently uh, we have incorporated the Caribbean into our region. So not only will we have uh, the Americas, but also the Caribbean join joining us this year. And our theme this year, if you heard what was going on at Davos and, and saw what they were talking about, we're really entering this conversation about what does responsible leadership look like? How are we reimagining stakeholder capitalism? And what does that mean for young people today? So we've kind of um, amalgamated those themes and ours is focused around sustainable leadership, specifically in equity and inclusion, climate environment and education and employment, which are all really timely topics and things that we're talking about here on a micro level in our city, but also on a macro level across the globe. Um, and so that's, we will be showcasing different parts of the city, different leaders in our city and different groups that are, are working towards making this happen. So you might be wondering, great, why are you telling me about this? Well, we need your help. Like Austin said, there's only 20 of us and we're, we're young. So um, we would love for you to join our advisory council. We have a team of leaders. Can you raise your hand if you're on our advisory council and here today? Thank you. So you've got some advisory council members sitting at your tables too. And this body really is helping us with venue and programmatic suggestions to make sure that we're really covering um, the innovative thinking that's happening in our city around our three impact areas. Um, so the way you can stay in touch with us, you've got young leaders at your table who are part of this group. We'll be around here. Please um, shout out at us. Talk to the, the young people at your table. Give us your information. We'd love to stay in touch with you. And um, you guys are all invited to come to our conference. So we're really excited and, and we hope that we can do this in partnership with you because we know that's how it's going to be a success. So thank you for your time. Julie, thank you for your leadership and thank you for that update. You too, Austin. Uh, so I'd like to now share a few updates on the GMC initiatives. Let me begin with Move Forward Milwaukee. That's the collaborative initiative with the city, the county, MMAC and others regarding the 1% sales tax increase for Milwaukee County to provide property tax relief and critical funding for public services, maintaining facilities, and investments in the future. Uh, the goal had been to move this effort to a voter referendum on the April ballot. Uh, the bills in the Senate 
and the assembly have been assigned to committees, uh, but there have been no hearings, which means they're basically stalled there. And uh, that means the deadline for inclusion on the spring ballot will not be met. Uh, we'll keep you informed, uh, but this is caught up in a fair amount of politics, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, it's caught up in politics uh, in Madison regarding you know, how the money will be spent and allocated. And, but we'll keep you informed uh, as progress is being made. So let me now give you an update on vibrancy of place. That's one of the three main initiatives of the GMC. MKE United is um, one of the main efforts addressing vibrancy of place that focuses on uh, the neighborhoods adjacent to downtown Milwaukee. Uh, and one of, the, one of the big accomplishments this past year has been the creation of an anti-displacement fund so that's been created, it's been funded, and it is helping to date 114 homeowners in areas where, they, where the homeowners have at least a five-year history, they're current on their mortgage, and their property taxes are increasing because of community efforts to upgrade that community. And rather than have them be driven out because they can no longer afford to live there, this fund has been created to help them pay their property tax. So the idea came from Atlanta, where it's successful, and um, I think to date, we all feel this, is, this has been a big success here in Milwaukee. Uh, also under Vibrancy of Place, there's an organization called Bruce City Match. Bruce City Match is helping to revitalize specific commercial corridors by pairing businesses and business people with vacant buildings uh, where they can place their business. And so um, I think that's, that's going well from what my notes say. <laughs> Under economic prosperity, we have Scale Up Milwaukee. So Scale Up is about to launch its seventh cohort. S Scale Up is seeking 15 businesses. They typically are one to 10 or one to 15 million in revenue. And this is an effort in partnership with UWM to uh, help teach these young business entrepreneurs all about management, marketing, production, finance, raising capital. So if any of you have ideas of uh, small companies that you think have growth prospects, uh, please pass them on to the GMC. There's also a SPARK program. A SPARK program is similar to Scale Up, but it's oriented towards minority-owned businesses. So that's a partnership between Bruce City Match that I referenced earlier and Scale Up. And they are graduating their fourth cohort of minority and women-owned businesses. And they do the same thing in terms of helping teach these entrepreneurs all about management, marketing, production, finance. And these companies have been experienced an average revenue growth rate of 48%. So uh, there's some really nice solid businesses there. The, the next initiative is innovation and talent. And so that today's main program addresses innovation and talent. And so let me and the initiative under innovation and talent is the Commons. So the Commons is run by Michael Hosted as executive director and Joe Peschel. And I'm going to invite Joe to come up and give us an update as to everything you're doing at the Commons. Joe.
so having that sort of like empowerment to say like, this matters and, and we trust that you're going to come up with a solution that's really innovative and, and actually solves the problem. I think that empowered me as well to so, um, sort of have more of a voice and grow in confidence. And I've had um, practically any networking um, in careers in this year, networking I did at the Commons. I think that's maybe the most valuable part of the Commons. The whole Commons team does such a good job and goes out of their way. That was Jenna Borowski. She now works at American Family Insurance with their institute team, uh, doing some really awesome work with their social impact stuff. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Heather, for putting all this together. Uh, she leaned over and she's like, we're like 10 minutes ahead of schedule. You can pull out your best improv material, uh, all of the jokes. I see Michael starting to sweat right now. Okay, I won't do that. Uh, <laughs> my name's Joe Peschel and I'm wearing a tie. Uh, <clears throat> I'm also the program director and co-founder of The Commons. Uh, and I, I even have some prepared notes. Um, we're excited about today's panel. We're gonna have a little bit of fun with these folks, all right? Uh, in just a couple of minutes, we'll have them come on up. Uh, we're excited about this panel because we have the opportunity to show you the breadth of what we do at the Commons and talk about how you and your organizations can become more engaged in the development of a robust and diverse pipeline of innovative leaders. We're gonna hear some amazing stories up here. Uh, and be forewarned, this will be a touch of an interactive panel. If you've got a pen in your pocket, you might wanna pull that out. We'll be using those in a little bit. Um, we do very hands-on exercises at the Commons, and so this is not anything out of the ordinary for anyone that's worked with us before. Many of you probably know the Commons for our work in the collegiate space working with college students from 24 different colleges and universities in the area. For almost six years now, we've been hard at work developing the entrepreneurial mindset through a variety of innovation experiences that have served thousands of students at this point uh, since our inception across this entire region. Uh, we've helped students build confidence. We've helped students build their professional networks. We've helped them build a new awareness of the meaningful work opportunities that exist in our region, just like Jenna's story there. We continue to offer our collegiate programming, but we've uncovered a larger opportunity to foster the entire leadership development journey of an innovative thinker. There's a lot that goes into that. From high school through career, our development as leaders. It didn't just happen in the last two years for any of you, right? No, it's been a journey. We've seen incredible growth in our professional market services, working with rising leaders within organizations to build a culture of innovation within those organizations. We've also found new opportunities to deepen partnerships for high school aged talent across our city. So started in college, and now we have this growth outward both directions there. Now in fact, uh, speaking of that, that growth, for the past th few months, we've been convening a group of over 40 nonprofit, non-accredited talent development organizations here in Milwaukee. 
40 plus of them. Uh, they're doing fantastic work across our city. Uh, we could go through a list of names, you're gonna recognize all of them. And in fact, we have a representative from uh, Teens Grow Greens right up here in the front. We're gonna hear some stories from her. Uh, these groups, uh, we've been bringing them together and they're, they're sharing ideas and resources. They're mapping out their roles and helping develop talent in Milwaukee. They're working towards defining common sets of metrics that can demonstrate how these like-minded organizations are collaborating and moving towards uh, shared uh, uh, metrics, uh, moving that needle to developing and retaining innovative talent in our region. This is good stuff. It's been inspiring, it's been energizing, to say the least. No matter the age though, we've come to understand the value of asking what's next, what's next? It's growth mindset. You're gonna hear that uh, theme across our panel today. Our work at the Commons is rooted in helping people achieve what's next in their journey, whether that's selecting a college to go to, securing their first job, maybe getting connected to a mentor, understanding what it means to start a new business perhaps, or just understanding how to leverage your skills to benefit the community. Our goal today is to show you that the leadership development journey, uh, how it plays out with these five panelists. And it's good to, gonna give you a glimpse into the questions and challenges that all of us face as we develop as innovative leaders. You'll hear from high school students to CEOs and everyone in between. We wanna show you that the importance of having these types of conversations and how the Commons is playing a role in supporting this growth across the entire ta talent pipeline is critical. From classroom through career. We're gonna see some good growth-minded people here. So with that, uh, we're going to get started. I'd like to have our panelists come up. You know who you are. They're gonna take a seat here. And while they're coming up, I'm gonna explain to everyone how this is gonna, how this is gonna go. All right, so I keep on mentioning this like classroom through career sort of thing. We have five panelists that represent this talent uh, development, leadership development journey. Uh, what we've told them is yes, there is just one giant step here, uh, actual stairs over there. The way that we're gonna play this out is, you know, mentorship does not always need to be uh, uh, seeking the highest level leader in an organization or a community and asking them a bunch of questions. In fact, really effective mentorship happens from learning from somebody that is just a step more experienced or has a few more connections, that's where you can really start to learn some, some critical uh, uh, lessons. You can get some fantastic advice from the person that's just one step ahead of you. And that's the good stuff. And so we put together this panel to kind of show some of this, this growth. Uh, we've asked each one of the panelists to think of a piece of advice, uh, a question to seek advice from the person that would be sitting directly next to them. All right, that's kind of interesting, right? So that person will get some advice. And as they are going, you'll see that there are some uh, sheets of paper at your table. Uh, we want to collect some of your advice as well. We'll collect that advice. We'll, we will literally collect that advice. So, so you will write some things down. We're going to collect that. We're committing to that. We're going to document things. And we're going to share your advi advice with each of the panelists as well. So that's how this is gonna be a little bit interactive. Uh, we find that there's a fantastic, well, I mean, not find. We know that there's a fantastic knowledge base in this room. And uh, really, really good advice. So it would be doing a disservice to everybody if we didn't capture some of that. So please jot down some notes as we go through all of this. And uh, I think it would be beneficial if we could just kind of quickly sweep through our entire panel here and get a brief introduction, maybe just a sentence or two, who you are, uh, where you're at in this leadership development journey, and then we'll go all the way back to the beginning uh, and we'll start to get some stories, all right? So brief intros. Hi, my name is Shimani Parks. I'm a sophomore at Carmen Northwest, and I am in Teens Go Greens. Awesome. Hi, I'm Olivia Menzia. I recently graduated from Marquette University and Myad, and I currently work for Summerfest as a designer as well as have my own ice cream startup. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ronell Washington, Partnership Development Advisor for American Family Insurance. I am the resident young professional, I guess, for this panel. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amanda Baltz. I'm the CEO of Spalding Medical, which is a private spinoff of a company I helped start uh, several years ago called Spalding Clinical Research. And our company brings cardiac monitoring uh, diagnostic solutions to both healthcare and pharmaceutical markets. And I'm Mike Lovell. Uh, I was at Marquette University in uh, my sixth year. And if I look down here, I realize I how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Is your mic working? I don't think it's All working right. that well. Okay. In and out a little bit. Yeah. Well, Amanda can share if uh, when we get there. So uh, let's give a round of applause for our panelists before they even begin. A little confidence <laughs> pump up. All right, here's what I love. So uh, Shimani, Teens Girl Greens, um, she has been working on this project while in high school uh, to, to come up with a, a, a new business with her business partner, Jalen. And you'll notice that Jalen is written on this thing. Like true uh, entrepreneurs and partners in, in a venture, uh, something came up with Jalen. And so we have, uh, you just took it right up and you're ready to go. Uh, so <laughs> I love that. <coughs> and with that, um, Let's hear a little bit about uh, what you are working on, what it's like uh, being at, at Carmen High School, and then you can uh, request your advice uh, from Olivia. So we'll just kind of move that way. Okay. Yeah. So me and my partner came up with a business called the Poochie Pouch. The Poochie Pouch is a fanny pack for dogs. It has two pockets and a reflector just in case you want to walk your dog at night. So we came up with this idea because we thought, <sighs> sorry. <laughs> We thought it would be easier for dog walkers to handle things like dog toys, treats, and poop bags. So I came up with this idea in a program called Teens Girl Greens. Teens Girl Greens is a nine month internship that helps teens, it helps teens with life skills through hands on experience. So I was introduced to the commons by the teens and it helped me think creatively and how to problem solve. And I just feel like it had a really big part in the Poochie Pouch. Because if it wasn't for the comments, I wouldn't know how to think creative to solve problems, how to profit from business, and um, yeah. <laughs> so then, what question do you have for Olivia? Olivia has uh, just recently graduated from uh, college and she's got some great experience. You know her through the dolphin pool competition, right? Like both of you pitched on the same there. stage. Yeah. <laughs> so some great connections here. What would you like to learn from Olivia? Since I'm still in high school, I would like to learn how to manage my time and like work on school and be a business owner. Oh, how do you balance it all? Is yeah. That, yeah. That's, that's what that is. <laughs> So Olivia, I would love to hear your answer to that. And then for everyone else here, some advice for Sham Shamini, uh, Shimani. Shimani, sorry, okay. <laughs> Shimani. This is the Jalen curveball that she threw me. I was like, I was preparing with her. Um, <laughs> jot down your advice to Shimani as well, all right? Yes, that's a great question. And I'm by no means a master of it yet, right? Everyone always struggles with having enough time to do so many different things that you want to do. And I guess my best advice is to prioritize what um, you feel you'll get the most experience from, what's the most genuine connections um, and the most impactful communities that you could be a part of. And so, you know, I am a say yes person. It's like impossible for me to say no. And I, I think it's a, it's a blessing in disguise, right? It's, it's really hard to say yes and manage your time. But saying yes means being a part of this community and feeling like you belong and getting a lot of networking opportunities, which has kind of led to where I am now. So um, like the fact that we did dolphin pool. So we did like a pitch competition and she p pitched the, the Bucci pouch and I pitched my ice cream business. And even there, like we became friends, which um, <coughs> is something that we both said yes to and we grew from it, right? We, we right. became a part of that community which was which was super cool and I, I really encourage that you say yes to those opportunities because me saying yes to the commons when I met Joe like randomly at the 707 hub which is another community that I found myself a part of um, led to me being up here and led to me trying all these different uh, opportunities throughout the city so it's kind of how I've gotten the spots that I'm in now so um, you know because I'm I feel a part of the community I feel confident that the ice cream business can succeed here. It's why I decided to stay here. Um, I actually almost moved out to Seattle this summer and thankfully when that opportunity arose, um, Joe, Maggie, Michael, they all were there and they kind of helped me map out why I should stay in Milwaukee and why there's opportunity here and why uh, I should invest in the community that has invested in me the past four years, especially over at Marquette. So um, just kind of deciding to put yourself 
completely into that community and it'll, it'll allow you to have a more flexible schedule and when, when you graduate high school, you'll have um, the opportunity to kind of pick what you want to do, you know? Um, I didn't get a traditional job right when I graduated. I did freelance design. I worked on my ice cream business. And then finally, my parents are really happy. I got a job with Summerfest <laughs> um, designing for the 2020 festival. So you can kind of pick and choose. And I think with the mindset that you have, you definitely are going to want to do that, especially with your great ideas like Poochie Pouch. Thank you. <laughs> Let's uh, encourage Shimani to say yes and get involved with our com community with a round of applause. <laughs> All right, Livia, you're a great public speaker. You were weaving in some of your story in there as well. Uh, <laughs> I try. Do you want to share a little bit more about who you are, where you are, and then uh, kick a question over to Renell? Yeah, totally. Right. Um, so I just graduated, like I had said, at Marquette. Love it. Yesterday was National Marquette Day. Um, I loved going to Myad in addition. It was really cool because I couldn't decide if I wanted to go to art school or if I wanted to go to university. And with the dual program, it gave me the opportunity to be the business mind and to be the artistic side. And so it was really cool going back and forth on the bus and like being an art kid for five minutes and then coming back and being all business. So um, it really kind of opened my mind to the different opportunities and communities throughout Milwaukee and I'm so grateful that I ended up staying here. Um, one thing I've been really trying to work on is just being a part of the community. Um, I'm really trying to invest and this is where I want to open my ice cream shop. I plan on staying here. I love the West Coast and I decided, you know, I can just go visit there for vacations when it's super cold here. Um, so that's the compromise with that. But yeah, it's it's been awesome being here and I'm, I'm really grateful for the Summerfest opportunity and being so connected that I can do freelance full time um, prior to that. So uh, yeah, I'm just very grateful and am excited to become a leader eventually in Milwaukee like the ones before me. Can you give a little bit about the ice cream company? I think it's oh, a yeah. good audience. Yes. Y'all like ice cream? Um, All right. Yeah. Well, my name's Olivia <coughs> and my, my friends call me Liv. So my company's called Live a Little. It's vegan ice cream. I'm not vegan. I'm not vegetarian. I'm just extra inclusive. I have a lot of dairy-free friends and I was the friend that's like, let's get ice cream. Let's get ice cream. And I'm like, ah, oh, they can't. Or there's only one flavor for them to pick up you know, other ice cream shops. And so that's what led me to creating coconut and oat milk based ice cream. And so we competed in dolphin pool together. I did brood ideas challenge at the 707 hub and ended up getting funding there to kind of take my business to the next level. So it's been super fun. And I finally got a food kitchen on Wisconsin Avenue. So things are um, becoming legit, which is super awesome. Cause before all my friends are like, this is just another dream that you have, but no, this is the one that's gonna happen. And hopefully in a few years, this is what my full-time job is. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. And everyone look under your seats. There's a pint of, no, I'm kidding. I wish. <laughs> yeah, I, need a, I need a bigger ice cream machine first. So, you know, <laughs> you uh, that's the next boat. step. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Olivia, what is the question that you have for Rennell? What advice are yeah, you seeking? Um, my question for Rennell is how do I find and seek leadership opportunities throughout the city um, as a young professional? Well, it seems like you're on your way, um, <laughs> you know, panel, panel done, but no. Um, shameless plug, you are dreaming fearlessly right now, mm -hmm. American family. Um, you're an entrepreneur, you're new in your career, um, you're making amazing strides. The beautiful thing is, is that you have, based on age, you have time on your side, and you also have a lot of energy. And you will learn, like the, uh, a lot of the other professionals in this room, that burnout is a thing. So. <laughs> Uh, saying, knowing when to say no is definitely one thing I would say. Um, the other thing I'd say is be willing to step outside of your comfort zone and seek these opportunities. Um, as a young person, um, as the only female in the room, you bring a lot of perspective that a lot of others don't have. So use those opportunities to use your voice and um, be willing to seek those experiences. The other thing is I'd say um, you're at a point where it's time to learn and build trust from those who are a little older than you and are the decision makers. So be intentional in seeking those meetings at your um, respective company. I know you're working at the world's largest music, music festival right now. Um, really amazing company. I know the people there, great leadership. Uh, probably one of the best jobs you could have gotten out of college. <laughs> I was very um, lucky. I know we spoke before you, we started the panel that you have a love for music. So you definitely schedule meetings with those decision makers there. and see what other opportunities outside of your day-to-day -day that you can plug into and um, grow your um, personal development. 
The other thing I'd say is um, seek opportunities outside of your company to connect. So there's, um, in other companies that have business resource groups and employee resource groups to connect with other young professionals um, like yourself who have like-minded um, goals in mind in terms of development. And then also volunteer. Um, nonprofit work is uh, really amazing. Uh, that's how I got a lot of my work and experience early on is a lot of uh, nonprofits in the room. Um, Julie's, for example, Global Shapers is one. Mm -hmm. I think I saw Boys and Girls Club back there. I volunteered for them for a long time. So seek organizations that are looking for energetic young people with the skill sets that you have in design, social media, and other opportunities to use those skill sets to um, help them grow their company and their respective mission. Um, you're an entrepreneur, so you can uh, network with other entrepreneurs, like you said, at the WIN 707 Hub. There are a lot of really amazing accelerators here in the city that you can partner with. Um, the Blueprint is one, um, the Commons Forum, which I'm in right now. Um, so that's another way to stretch your network too. And then uh, one of the last points I'll say is um, don't be afraid to create your own opportunity. Um, I, I know there's a lot of different organizations here in the city of Milwaukee, but if there's something that you're really passionate about that um, tends to your personal mission and vision for what you want your life to be, um, don't be afraid to create it. Uh, this amazing thing called social media and technology is just uh, so amazing. You can connect with people in Seattle and um, do business with them and you know they can fly here and you can go there and you can just uh, get to anybody that you want to with the tools and resources that you have. Um, lastly, I'll say too is you're at a time in your life where you can make mistakes. So don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, you don't have to have it all figured out. I'm in my 30s, I don't either. Um, this is a time where you can try a lot of different things and you have enough runway based on age that um, you can make mistakes, you can uh, be really aggressive, you can take risk, and you can bounce back and still become a CEO like these folks so cool. to my left. So <laughs> that's my advice. Thank you. Let's encourage Olivia to take some risk, experiment with some things, and have the confidence to build uh, new stuff right here in Milwaukee. The round of applause. Please jot down some of your advice for Olivia as well on the worksheets. And then we move over to Rennell. Uh, you were giving a little bit of your story in there as well. You're all, this is a great panelist. Yeah. Like, keeps my job really easy. Uh, but let's hear a little bit about your story. And then sure. you have a piece of advice to request from Amanda. I do. So I have a really unique story. Um, I had the pleasure of joining American Family Insurance about six months ago now um, after uh, a long career in financial services and banking. So a lot of you probably know me from being a banker at uh, a couple um, local banks here in the city of Milwaukee. Um, recently made the switch because I had an amazing conversation with an amazing leader named Liana, who's sitting in the room. Um, our passions aligned. Um, the next steps about how we take Milwaukee to the next level uh, with the resources that American Family had, and the rest is history. So right now, we are in the process of growing our talent pipeline for American Family Insurance. Um, that's my role, is to going out and developing um, partnerships for K-12 colleges, universities, and also a professional organization. So uh, some of you have probably been reaching out for meetings. Um, I'm a little backed up right now, but those will happen and occur. Uh, my colleagues in the room are really great. Uh, Jilly, Maritza, Camille, and Joanne, who are helping assist those partnerships. So we're the team here that are doing that work. And we thank you all for um, being champions of American Family Insurance as you make these investments. Uh, one of the other things I didn't get a chance to talk about is that I'm a co-founder of a young professionals group called Social X MKE, which helps um, with some diversity, inclusion, and talent retention and recruitment efforts. Here in the city of Milwaukee, we're celebrating eight years coming up in August. Um, it's an amazing resource that we created because we felt like as young professionals of color here in the city of Milwaukee that we weren't um, getting the time and attention that was needed to help us grow. Um, it's um, a passion that I have. I want Milwaukee to be able to compete like the Atlantas, the um, DCs, the Houstons, the LAs, the Chicagos that a lot of people are leaving Milwaukee for. And we have to remedy this brain drain in order for Milwaukee to compete. So when we talk about diversity, we have to think about different ways to keep our people here and also attract them. So that's what our group does. And they also volunteer in a lot of other spaces too. Financial literacy is one of my um, really amazing things that I do with Secure Futures. 
Um, I also sit on a charter school board called Milwaukee Excellence, so education is really important to me. That, uh, like these two to my right, uh, somebody gave me the opportunity to take my education to the next level, and I want to do the same there too. So all of the work that I do for American Family Insurance uh, is like a blessing because everything that I've learned, every person that I've met with, uh, planted a seed in me, and that's what I'm able to do for those others behind me, and then also those that I meet going forward. That's awesome. Thank yep. you, Rennell. So, uh, what is the piece of advice you would like to request from Amanda? Yeah, so Amanda, um, my question for you is, uh, one second, sorry. You have had an interesting career path and recently transitioned to a CEO position. How do, you prepare, how do you prepare for career opportunities? Thank you, Rennell. Um, so much of what you're already doing is right on track. So being extremely engaged and involved in your community, um, volunteering and particularly serving on boards, I have found is really, really helpful in terms of um, connecting with and, and seeing optimal and different types of structures of, of way that organizations um, develop leadership. Um, the one thing that I have found uh, for me personally throughout my career um, is I'm very, very active in um, different networking circles and additional learning opportunities. So um, one of them being scale up, uh, another one, uh, <laughs> I was cohort number one um, and really seized any and all opportunities I could get my hands on in terms of helping me um, figure out what we needed to do to grow as an organization. Uh, I was a, I'm a part of Tempo and um, Vistage Tech for a while and, and the round tables and the, the people that you're networking with really help create a great network of people who they themselves might not have some of the experience that, that you want to have, but they'll know how to connect you with those individuals. Mm -hmm. So continuing to put yourself um, out there and being very intentional about where you want to go in your career will help you attract different leaders that want to help you get to that next level. Um, so I really, really believe in, in mentorship. The other thing I'll say is that opportunities don't always come along at perfect times. So you may not feel perfectly prepared for an opportunity, mm -hmm. but don't necessarily step away from it because you don't feel like you've, you've been fully prepared. Leverage your network and the mentorship circles that you've created for yourself and seize the opportunity. Shall we encourage Rinaldo to seize some opportunity? All right. Thank you. All right, Amanda. You do have an interesting story. <laughs> Let's hear a little bit of that, and then we'll uh, hit Mike with a good question. Sure. Yeah. So um, back in 2007, uh, my family and I set out to build a next generation uh, clinical research facility with an emphasis on cardiac safety analysis. This was around the time that drugs like Vioxx and Fenfen were being pulled from the market due to sudden cardiac death. And so we set out to basically right the wrongs in pharma and um, improve cardiac safety testing in the phase one setting. And we did it, we grew um, with the help of a lot of uh, different people within the community as well as a really strong um, investment group that we had. Um, we were able to grow and strengthen that business. And then um, along the way, we developed a handheld cardiac monitoring device and software solution we quickly realized that we had a whole new budding opportunity underneath the clinical research organization. So um, we spun it out and that is now a standalone entity and is growing. And um, last year at this time, I think we had something like 10 employees and today we have 40 with sites of hitting 75 by the end of the year. We signed some really great partnerships and we're expanding to not just being now a device and software company, but really an expanded platform of cardiac solutions. So that's been um, the bulk of my, my story and my journey. And, um, and again, um, very grateful for the partnerships and scale up and things like that that have helped us get there. Yeah, it sounds like scale up did its job in getting the growth mindset there, yeah. I'm pointing at you, Elmer, yeah. <laughs> and that is Elmer shouting in the back in case anyone wasn't aware of, yeah. <laughs> All right, Amanda, uh, we have Mike Lovell sitting next to you. Uh, what are some questions that you would ask Mike? What are you seeking to learn? Sure. So, Mike, you are in a leadership position that works with talent on all levels of the career journey. 
um, as well as being president of an institution that has direct impact on young leaders. So how are you elevating talent and leaders to support the success of your organization? Um, and what do you wish you could do more of? Could go ahead and borrow your mic, hopefully this one will yeah. work better than the one I had. Um, well, first, I, I do, I do want to say that, you know, when you reach a uh, position like I have, which is kind of the, the top point of your career, uh, what happens is, is that personal accomplishments no longer uh, become important or as important. And I really, uh, David Brooks, if you've read his book, The Second Mountain, talks about how the second mountain in your career is helping others achieve success and, and become the best versions of themselves and really help impact a society in a positive way. And so when I think about the question you asked, you know, you know for me, you know, it's really important for everyone, not only in the university, but maybe in our community to help them you know, reach their full potential and, and be successful in whatever their goals are. And so I think uh, part of the thing is, you know, for those of uh, us who are leaders, you know, in peak of, people report to us or we get to interact with, it's really important for us to find out what their goals are and what they want to accomplish and give them the ability to accomplish those, whether it be experiences um, or find uh, unique ways you know, for them uh, to gain the skills that they need to be successful. And um, it's interesting because I heard the word uh, from both Ronell and Amanda about volunteering. and. Yeah, one of the things that I think is very, very important uh, is to provide platforms for everyone, certainly on our campus, uh, to find ways to engage with our community. Because I think that is critically important uh, for their professional growth and, and, and their success. And, you know, I think when you ask, you know, what I wish I could do more of, well, I wish I had even more time uh, to commit uh, to giving back to our community and making it uh, even a better version of what it is today. And uh, yeah, it's interesting because when you give people the opportunity to go out and work in the community, which, you know, the mission of Marquette University is to produce men and women who live their life in service with and in service uh, to others. And, uh, you know, I think about Olivia, how, how proud I am of you uh, down there and all that you're doing and all you're accomplishing. And, uh, but I would say is, you know, both Ronell and Amanda, you know, really talked about how they grew uh, by volunteering and working in our community. And, you know, one of the roles as, as leaders to help people accomplish their goals is find ways to help them stretch and, and, and actually maybe even get out of their comfort zone. Because I really think that's when true growth happens. And I even think about myself, uh, you know, where, where have I grown in the past few years? And I would say that I've grown uh, through my work in the community, particularly uh, trying to address trauma in the community. And uh, I think about how my knowledge has expanded. You know, first of all, I know now more about neuroscience than I ever had known uh, in my previous 50 years of life. Uh, but I also understand our community much better and the challenges that we face and uh, the, how trauma and racism and our segregation really, you know, how deep rooted it is. And until we address these really difficult issues, we're never gonna be the city uh, we all know we wanna be and can be. And so, uh, and also, so I think, you know, my understanding of that actually helps me be a better leader on our own campus when I think about issues around diversity, inclusion, and, you know, how we can be the best version of ourselves as a campus. And, you know, I think it's really important, again, to, to provide those that are around you that same opportunity to, to volunteer and work in the community. And I, I like to give one example of uh, one of our uh, associate uh, vice presidents of advancement, Stacy Mitz. Uh, Stacy. Uh, uh, we gave her the opportunity and, and she you know, really embraced working with the Milwaukee Jewish Federation. And through her walk, work with the Milwaukee Jewish Federation, she actually uh, found out that 22% of students on college campuses have significant food insecurity. Many of them go, uh, are, are often hungry uh, because of all the other things they have in terms of uh, the finance, financial burdens they carry, just paying for books and tuition. So there's always not enough time for food. and so. Uh, in her role as advancement, you know, for those of you who uh, attended Marquette, probably remember McCormick Hall, which no longer stands, uh, was able to live there, but uh, we took it down last year. And uh, through the process of taking it down, Stacy had this uh, great idea. It says, why don't we, you know, fundraise? And uh, people bought nameplates, uh, uh, people paid for these nice koozies, and, um, but what made, made her idea unique was not just fundraising, but to use those funds to help address the food insecurity that existed with students on our campus, because one in five of our students uh, have food insecurity. And uh, through <coughs> this fundraising effort, 
uh, she was able to raise more than $90,000 for our backpack program. And what the backpack program is, is that we have a food pantry where students can come and put food in their backpack uh, that they need them. And so uh, it's hundreds of students on our campus now have access to food that they otherwise didn't. And she learned this and she grew from her work in volunteering with the Milwaukee Jewish Federation, where they were working on, <clears throat> again, uh, creating opportunities for individuals who don't have food to have food. So uh, that was kind of a long-winded answer, so I apologize. But uh, really, I think uh, uh, community engagement and, and volunteering and serving is, is a great way uh, to ensure that uh, you and those around you continue to grow as leaders. Let's encourage Amanda to tackle that second mountain and help others around her grow yeah, yeah. and be a community leader. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so you might see on this uh, one sheeter page here, uh, the last question, the GMC member question. I think Mike, that's, that's you putting this back out yeah. on everyone else too, right? Yeah, so, so I think uh, what we would like to know from uh, those of you in the audience today is, you know, how are you elevating talent and leaders to support the success of your organization? You know, and, and what do you wish you could do more of? I'd like us all to take a moment to think that through, jot down a couple of notes, maybe uh, kick an idea around with somebody next to you, uh, have a brief conversation about that. Uh, but how are you elevating talent? What do you wish you could do more of? What does this world look like within your organization? Didn't know you'd be thinking so much today, wow. huh? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, yes, I, a friend of mine just literally, like, Amazon shipped it to me, like, you have to read this yeah, book after really a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Over there. What's yeah. his... All right, thank you all for taking a moment to reflect on that. Let's give a round of applause to our amazing panelists. Thank you all. This is a great segue. So this is our leadership development journey right in front of us. These five people representing uh, some really amazing talent, uh, the growth mindset. That leads us into what I think the next slide says, our big idea. Um, at the Commons, uh, we have this opportunity to interact with all these folks across this entire spectrum. We are no longer sitting squarely in the collegiate space, but we have an opportunity to connect with younger talent, uh, older talent going through their careers and, and succeeding and growing. This is an opportunity to grow the region's innovative leadership pipeline. Uh, it is the next generation of all of you in these seats in this room. They're right here. There's five of them right here. Well, you already sit in the seat every now and then. Uh, <laughs> We can offer engaging programming. We can connect these folks together. We can help them build stronger relationships, uh, grow their own selves, their network, uh, their skill sets, and their confidence to do things within our community. And so our ask to everyone here is that uh, we need your help. Uh, if you would like to serve on the Talent and Innovation Council uh, that meets regularly to discuss uh, how we engage with and activate people like this that are up here, uh, if you would like to connect us with your HR and talent acquisition folks, uh, we're happy to have these conversations about how this type of programming and, and hands-on learning looks within your organization and how we can connect it to our talent partners outside of your organization. And then finally, consider how our programming may help augment uh, and complement some of your strategies around organizational development and the culture of innovation within your, your business or uh, institution. So. With that, just want to leave that uh, at the bottom of your sheet. If you want to say like, heck yeah, sign me up. Uh, we'll take that and, and follow up via email. I think some information is also going to go out uh, from Heather after this meeting. So thank you all again for uh, listening, for playing along and jotting down things on your sheets. We will be collecting those and digitizing it and sharing all the wonderful advice to you all. Uh, one final round of applause for everybody up here. And I'm going to go off stage.
Okay, Joe, thank you very much, and thank you, panelists. You did a great job. I'd like to also thank Jilly again, and Austin, and congratulate Linda and Peggy and WEC Energy for uh, receiving the Mary Ellen Stanick Award. So the, that, that concludes today's program. The next meeting is March 13th. It's the Diversity in Business Awards. It's held at the War Memorial. The meeting after that is April 13th. It'll be back here. And if you are on the board of directors of the GMC, if you just come up here for two minutes, there's a little bit more business that we have to uh, handle. Otherwise, I wish everyone a great day and a good week. Thank you. Thank you.